El mundo puede detenerse. Tus sueños no. Elige bien. Elige UPB. Good morning to all the audience in Colombia and Latin America, and good afternoon to our audience in Germany and Europe. I'm Marta Caballero, professor at the UPB Language Center, and today I will be guiding the event as moderator. Welcome to the second part of HEPCOPA Lecture Series, a project organized by Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana Bucaramanga and the University of Potsdam as part of the Higher Education Potsdam Colombian Partnership. The HEPCOPA project is a bilateral initiative developed jointly by Colombia and Germany in which the University of Potsdam, Universidad de Caldas, Pontificia Universidad Javeriana Cali, Colombian Universities Association, ASCUN, and Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana Bucaramanga have worked together since 2018 to build up capacities in the areas of quality, digitalization, and management in higher education. Today, we are going to talk about a comparison of the practice of online arbitration in e-commerce. Before we be a start of the lecture, I want to invite you to the virtual course, Society for Transformation Processes. The HEPCOPA lecture series will give a participation certificate to the audience that completes at least 80% of the activities that will be posted on the platform. If you want to complete your registration in the course, please click on the link that is fixed on the top of the YouTube chat. Now, we'll be starting with the talk, so let me introduce you to our speaker for this lecture, Dr. Santiago Dusan. Dr. Santiago Dusan is a law and economics scholar with expertise in entrepreneurship, consumer regulation, history of economic thought, private means of dispute resolution, and a spontaneous legal order. He is a doctor of the law from Sirius Law School in Hamburg and holds an LLM from the University of Cologne. The key issues of this lecture is how the digital world regulates disputes. A closer look at the procedure using an example of Germany and Colombia. Dr. Dusan, welcome to HEPCOPA Lecture Series. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your invitation and for that kind and undeserved introduction you just made. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you and share my thoughts on this issue that I've been working in uh, for the last five years, actually. And well, if all goes well, there will be a, a book coming up this year, especially talking, particularly talking about these issues. Uh, well, so let me begin by showing you some, some of the order we, we will be following. After a short introduction, we'll be discussing the, the notion of online arbitration uh, through its most fundamental elements. And well, after that, we're going to ask ourselves the question of whether or not this concept of online arbitration, uh, which attempts to, to substitute national courts, uh, it succeeds in this regard or it doesn't. And finally, we're going to go uh, through some concluding remarks. And before that, we're going to shortly uh, be discussing the some of the economic incentives behind the use of, of this legal institution. So as an introduction, let us begin by talking a little bit of uh, the evolution of e-commerce. And the origins of the internet can be traced back to the 1960s in the United States when it consisted on a few interconnected networks that were used either for academic or military purposes. That was it. There were not so many users and the need for formal or sophisticated means to dispute resolution was rather low. And arguably, the need for more formal means to dispute resolution is directly proportional to the number of users within a community, as well as to the complexity of their interactions. And it was only after roughly 1992 that the growing number of interconnected of these interconnected networks networks were 
beginning to be used for other purposes, especially for commercial purposes. And well, given the rise in popularity of the internet, it was gradually rec recognized that there were there was a diverse amount of legal relationships being built among its users, especially when involved in commercial trade, as we just discussed. And, and, and as this trend grew, so it did the frequency of legal disputes between sellers and buyers. And of course, we had failure to deliver by the online seller and overcharging, and as well as a certain disputes that were, are up to today common to specific internet uses, such as problems with payment processings. And these were becoming rather common as the exchanges were beginning to take place in the newly be, newly be emerging e-commerce platform. Big, huge giants of e-commerce that we have today, such as eBay and, and, and Amazon. And these emerging disputes were taking place along a rather short supply of security means. E-commerce platforms such, such as Amazon and eBay started to realize that people will only enter into e-commerce transactions partly because they will feel sufficiently secure at doing that. And the possibility to resolve disputes when this happens or when this happened uh, back then can and could and can be seen as a determin determinant as a very important cause for e-commerce e -commerce world. And well, here is where something such as online arbitration becomes re relevant. And um, of course, such growth that we're talking yet or, uh, about uh, is directly proportional to what we call, what we normally call internet pen penetration. Within the EU, Countries where con the countries where consumers are most active buy on online are Sweden, Denmark, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And around the world, the lowest penetration has been reported in Asia and Africa. Uh, and Latin America is roughly between those two. And in this context of expanding demand for dispute resolution mechanisms, we should place our attention on the problems that, were, that are observable in traditional dispute resolution means. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about national judges, national courts. These national judges, or physical, uh, even arbitration, to name a few, lack the very important element that made e-commerce so attractive in the first place, namely the internet. Internet communications represent uh, large savings for buyers and sellers in terms of money and time. And any attempt to give resolution to such disputes through traditional mechanisms would signify prohibitive costs, very high costs for market agents, negatively impacting e-commerce growth, of course. Well, the, the aim of online arbitration thusly was and continues to be now uh, up until today, and the substitution to some degree of national courts in the adjudication of these e-commerce disputes. It's objective to say in, in other words, is to be uh, an, alternate, an alternative means to national courts and that individuals use them instead, use uh, uh, online arbitration tribunals instead of national courts. Uh, well, as you see here, there is some political awareness and some legis legis legislative uh, responses to this. And we have here some examples of the EU we have the ADR directive, which translates into our alternative dispute resolution directive, directive and, and ODR regulation, regulations, which directly applies to online dispute resolution, which is of course more applicable to internet matters. But let me just go through the slides here. What is after all online arbitration? Well, we have not the time to go to, to, to add complexity to this discussion, but simply put, online arbitration is the result of integrating a capital means, a factor of production, such as the internet, and uh, arbitration, as is generally understood. 
at its base, it is no different that arbitration over the phone, or experiencing mar only marginal differences in the particular context where it is practiced, and facing, of course, any number of challenges depending on the context that it, that is that is practiced. It's not the same to practice arbitration in the most sophisticated financial financial transactions, as it is not the same to practice it in the most common brick and mortar, high volume, low value e-commerce uh, e-commerce consumers uh, exchanges. Uh, but talking about the, this general concept of arbitration, arbitration is generally defined as a private dispute resolution mechanism and controlled directly by the parties, and meaning to substitute and exclude the use of traditional courts, national courts. And from this definition, it can be understood that the procedure and the way the decision is rendered is the re direct result of consent by the parties that the parties choose the third neutral, the third person giving resolution to the dispute on their behalf, and that this one has to be rendered in an effective, as an effective decision. The, the arbitrator has to render an effective decision observing certain procedure, central, certain rules of procedure, which will we assimilate as what we usually, what we lawyers usually call due process. Uh, well, entering more into the concept of online arbitration, we need to be making some references to certain special contexts or situations or kinds of exchanges. And my research has been placed in discussing online arbitration, referring to or apply as applied to e-commerce consumer disputes. So many references that I will be making will be in this regard, in this con in this particular context. So the first element that we have regarding arbitration is an online arbitration agreement. So focusing or placing our attention, our, our attention in online arbitration in particular, we should mention that a freely entered agreement is a necessary condition of online arbitration, as it is for general arbitration. So from the outset, with this initial agreement, usually through a clause or a, yeah, normally through a clause within the contract, and besides the fact that they're indeed excluding the, the parties, are excluding the possibility to attend national courts, to have their, their, day, at, their day at court, the parties choose for themselves a sort of language of interaction during the disputes. So in this regard, not only the, the rules governing the initial exchange are chosen in principle by the parties upon which the dispute is going to be resolved, but also the rules of the procedure and depending on the of, on the kind of dispute at hand, there are situations in which the dispute must be resolved or adjudicated on the basis on the basis of certain sets of national legislation, and this is the case for consumer uh, consumer e-commerce disputes, which are the object of all you know very strict and heavy public policy, public policy regulations, of which neither the parties nor the arbitrator can opt out of. And how, after all, is this? controlled by the state, the monopolist of legal protection. The state is one of the, is the monopolist and it's, it's a monopolist and one of the, oh, its monopolies, uh, it's legal production. Well, nowadays, any kind of arbitration is the object of certain degree of state control exercised through national courts. If it were the case that certain kinds of agreements to arbitrate some disputes were to enter into conflict with particular aspects of national public order, that this public policy that I have just mentioned, courts will be in a position to control this. And, and even though that in the definition of arbitration given earlier, it can be understood that it is private, the reality of its practice reveals us that in order to be effective, it must somehow rely on national courts. I mean, the very thing that it attempts to substitute. And if faced with uh, what we normally name in law a recalcitrant loser of the final decision. I mean, one of the parties has just lost the, 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 the arbitration and he's not willing to abide by the contents uh, of, the, of the decision. He's not willing to comply with the, with the mandates that it is, it is um, found in the decision, uh, which is the ultimate, what ultimate online arbitration procedures do. One effective way to induce him to comply with the obligation of the decision is by default the threat of the use of eventual force in the future, of which nowadays also the state is the sole monopolist. So in order to participate of this monopoly of force, final arbitration decisions must be brought at some point in time in front of a national judge 
so they can ex be executed with effectiveness. It depends on what the judges will say or grant to these decisions. And we call that leave of enforcement. In, in this regard, the control the state exercises over online arbitration is through the eventual revision of the final decision. And this particular fact impresses us upon online arbitration in consumer disputes, very important effects that we will discuss later on in a few minutes. So as in the case of general arbitration, an online arbitration agreement usually includes all of the essential elements of arbitration. So alongside what is usually known as a natural and accidental elements. And all of you law students will know what I'm talking about. Uh, as, it is, as it is usually practiced in e-commerce, the idea is that the agreement to arbitrate online is made by using the same means that were initially used when undertaking the initial transaction online. Hence, the arbitration agreement is made by electronic means, electronic means, sorry, uh, most of the time through a single click, enable documents, e-documents, electronic documents, and electronic signatures. At the end, what makes arbitration online arbitration is the degree of internet incorporation into the procedure. And we see this as a function of the number of IC, what we call ICT tools. That will be internet communication tools uh, that are chosen to conduct the procedure. These tools should be integrated and embedded into the arbitration process itself to the degree of becoming indispensable for the general functioning of the arbitration process, even to the point at which most of, due process of, of the due process elements that are included into the procedure are conducted either wholly or substantially online. Well, the practice of online arbitration requires software on a website, which provides for the necessary means to, to the undertaking of the contractual steps online. For example, the filing of the initial claim can be done by completing a form that the provider uploads, uploads to, the, to this platform with strict diligence concerning the verification of the identity of the parties by means of electronic signatures or other or, or available means. And the appointment of the neutrals can be done first by presenting the profiles of the arbitrators, being the plaintiff able to check their credentials and fields of expertise. And the initial choosing of the arbitrators can be done either by clicking on their pictures or other, you know, in some other way, which usually alerts a platform manager who will, in turn, make the first contact with the arbitrators or arbitrator. So arbitrators can accept to study and adjudicate the dispute by filing, by filling a form embedded in the platform, thus informing the online arbitration provider of his choice. From this point on, the latter can notify the plaintiff that the proceedings have started. In addition to this, the defendant is notified so he can start preparing his defense. And all of, the, all, all of this uh, goes through a direct or sometimes automated message sent to the parties. Once these are given the possibilities to submit evidentiary material by uploading files containing such documents, these are securely presented to the appointed arbitrators. In addition to this, by some providers, for example, the parties are granted the possibility to be heard by means of video conferencing or through written, written statements presented through the platform itself or the website or through email. But we need to ask ourselves, why do parties opt for online arbitration in the first place, besides the fact that it integrates the internet in its functioning and saves costs, costs for the agents using it well, it's a rather simple, actually. For the same reason that arbitration is generally chosen, and that would be to avoid the cost of using the national courts and to opt for a swifter, more informal, and more special, I mean, to dispute resolution. And in order to achieve this, when drafting the agreement, the parties must consent to the manner in which the third neutral is to be chosen, the procedure is to gain or lose in complexity through implementation of due process elements, and the conditions under which the judgments, the final de decisions, are to be made effective in the manner in which a judicial decision is effective. Another element, another essential element, will be the choice over who is going to be the arbitrator. So the, beside the possibilities to circumvent the use of national courts, arbitration also supposes the party's possibility to choose the third neutral resolving the dispute. In a way, it can be argued that 
this is the essential element of, it, of arbitration that truly marks the distance from traditional courts. Courts do not compete against each other in the same manner that private entrepreneurs do. While arbitrators do compete against each other for the patronage of users, so usually does goes the argument, we could say, the positive effects of it are more action, accentuated. There are incentives to be swifter, to be the swifter, the, the fairest, the most capable arbitrator, the most knowledgeable when the opportunity to decide cases arises. So B2C arbitration, that is B business to consumer arbitration, should also participate of these features, of course. Well, the fact that the arbitrator is chosen by the parties to the agreement is then probably the one element, if not the most important element that impresses arbitration in general and this online arbitration in particular, which is an entrepreneurial character and the specialization that derives from it and entrepreneurs in the market gain in specialization and the, the same happens to online arbitrators. So it's usually argued that the that arbitrators compete for the choice of the parties seeking an entrepreneurial gain. Competition, as we know it, is the trial and error process between entrepreneurs proposing different products through different technologies to the consumers. This process can be understood as the different ways in which entrepreneurs that discovered knowledge about consumer preferences and about how those are to be satisfied. Through the mechanism of economic calculation, profit and losses expressed in prices, that will be the, the sum of it, and the entrepreneur finds out that if, well, finds out if what he's producing satisfies the consumers or not. Obviously, the, the entrepreneur is uh, that by the use of certain technologies satisfies the consumer in the most efficient way gains a competitive advantage over his competitors. Entrepreneurs obviously seek a monetary return from, from their activities, but their function is undertaken by exercising what we call in, in economics judgment. That would be a purposeful, purposeful sorry, behavior under uncertainty, a sort of a skill that is intuitive. Uh, for dealing with resource allocation under conditions of uncertainty. And if, if it is going to be argued that arbitrators experience incentives to be good arbitrators, this is due to the competition they face with other arbitrators and the possibility to be excluded by the choice of the arbitration consumer. Being the arbitrator and an entrepreneur, that is that will be my thesis, he participates of the exercise of judgment. And in reality, there are numerous ways in which arbitration sex selection procedures can be designed. But in addition to this, it is also possible to add a second stage of screening of the arbitrators. It is usually the case in arbitration system, systems that the parties can veto some of the arbitrators appointed to the dispute. And that among the reasons to be vetoed, parties take into consideration expertise, training, consistency, and known impartiality or partiality. Finally, with this competition, arbitrators usually gain in specialization of knowledge. And this makes it, this makes it, it possible that, that they get up the, uh, these particular skills for certain types of disputes, which range for the, from the simple disputes that we just talked about, uh, arising for high volumes, low value uh, exchanges, of goods and services or uh, to the most sophisticated financial transaction. We must mention that, however, that online arbitration finds itself in a rather early stage of development. And there has been little to none experimentation when it comes to dispute education of consumer disputes, especially online. Uh, online arbitration providers are still have been for the past 10 years and are still on the search for the best business model possible. And there are not that many online arbitration providers. I dare you do a quick Google search and you will see that the name online arbitration is barely mentioned. Well, at this point, we may ask ourselves whether in online arbitration, the third neutrals are required to be lawyers. I mean, certified legal experts. Well, the answer is a no, but a qualified no. The fact that it is 
the, the, that the great majority of an arbitrator, arbitration providers do not demand this from the arbitrators composing their panels. Online arbitrators can be specialists in various branches of knowledge, many of which are not necessarily of a legal kind. For example, certain kinds of disputes, it would be more useful for it that the appointed online arbitrator will be experts in the technical aspects of an e-commerce transaction than on the legal aspects of it, of it. We have to take into consideration, of course, that legal knowledge is rather expensive. I mean, you have to go through law school that will be minimum of five years period of, uh, of time. And, and, and normally it is expensive to, to go to law school. Not, However, as I, as I will explain later on, that online arbitrators are required or not to be legal professionals. And if they are, this increases the cost of, of online dispute resolution, as lawyers usually are very costly. It depends on the type of dispute at hand. For e-commerce disputes, for example, the fact that the consumer is the subject of heavy, very heavy regulation reflecting public policy impacts online arbitration practice in such a way that the incentives to appoint only lawyers as online arbitrators are more easily experienced. This will depend, of course, uh, on whether it is practice in countries like Colombia or, or Germany. And another fundamental aspect of online arbitration will be the implementation of, of uh, due process elements. And as in traditional arbitration, in online arbitration, due process is demanded so it can be considered a reliable alternative for traditional education procedures. This observation of due process elements in B2C e-commerce online arbitration seeks to achieve a twofold objective. It provides for the necessary signal to trust the potential users. Uh, and this is of special relevance, taking the, the consideration that the slow development of ODR, of online dispute resolution, is to be attributed partly to a very acute lack of trust. So discrimination between providers or non-providers offering fair online arbitration procedures from those who do not is possible to some extent by virtue of the degree of due process elements that are, they integrate into the procedure. Parties enter the arbitration procedures with the expectation of being treated, of course, equally or impartially or, or unequally when it is legal is justifi justifiable. Uh, we do opportunities to, to submit and render their own version of the facts, to submit ev uh, evidence, to be duly notified of the steps of the procedure and of, of, uh, about the actions of their counterparties. Um, and we should remember that all these elements are to be conducted through these internet communication technology tools based heavily on the internet if the procedure is, going, is ever going to be considered online arbitration. Here we have to mention something. And the more due process elements are included in online arbitration, the more it costs, the more its costs go up. And this, of course, needs to be analyzed from the premise that on account of its economic nature, the involvement of the consumer in the procedure justifies to a certain point a higher degree of uh, legal protection. The point here is that uh, the stricter the observant of due process uh, in small value claims are, the higher the dispute resolution costs. And concerning an arbitration conducted through the internet, swiftness and velocity of the procedure conflicts directly with the strict compliance of due process. So strict compliance of due process is actually not a very good thing here when it comes to, to, to e-commerce. These e-commerce transactions with consumers can be considered to be among those where the stakes are rather low on account of the small value of the original claim that would be disputed. In the case of Germany, for example, the average amount of money that a consumer spends buying online is circa uh, 800 euros a year. That would be 74 euros a month. So in the event that there is a legal dispute and being interested in the parties in seeking legal remedies through the judicial systems, those parties must take into account that the average time that the, com that the enforcement of the contract takes in this country is, according to the World Bank, almost 500 years. Right? Days, sorry, 500 days, which is the number of days that takes going through the traditional stages of the procedure, filing in the, the claim and, 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 and getting a result. Uh, finally, we have the element that 
there needs to be a binding decision. The final result will be a binding decision. It is an essential feature of the general concept of arbitration that it produces a, a results and it results in this binding and final decision. And by final, it is meant that the decision is supposed to be definitive. The same case cannot, the same case with the same legal cause and object cannot be neither relitigated nor arbitrated one more time. We call this res judicata or cosa juzgada in Spanish. Um, and if it is said that arbitration is a dispute resolution mechanism of an adjudicative nature, it is because the decision uh, produced by it is binding like a judgment of coming from a judge is binding. It is the power to adjudicate granted by the parties undertaken by an impartial and neutral third party, which defines arbitration in general. And arbitration decisions are enforced by summary judicial proceedings according to the law of the forum of the country, of course, where, where uh, enforcement is sought and under the provisions of the New York Convention or NYC if the award is foreign and if the court where the award is sought to be enforced belongs to a state, to a state that is signatory to this international convention. B2C online arbitration participates of this feature, of this very traditional characteristic. Its character of be being binding is meant to be of a legal nature. It is a governance institution after all, one that deals with matters of law. If, in, if online arbitration is to be considered an institution of law, it is because the compliance, the compliance of its results are capable of being ultimately induced by allocating the means of legitimate force. This being, like I, like I mentioned earlier, this being currently the object of monopoly of the state and exercise through, through its, its agencies. The most likely matter in which online arbitration final decisions are to be made Binding is by initially agreeing on what is called conditionally binding arbitration. And this is very interesting. In that way, in this conditionally binding arbitration, both parties to a PC contract agree on arbitration, but at different points in time. In time. The seller binds himself to online arbitration from the very moment the standard form contract is perfected. From the outset, they already excluded the possibility the possible use of traditional courts for any dispute arising from that contract. At this stage, the consumer remains unbound by arbitration and he holds still the right to turn to courts in case of a dispute arises. And notwithstanding, the process begins. At the moment the decision is about to be rendered, knowing its content and direction, where, where, knowing where it's going, and going to, the consumer is presented the alternative of deciding whether he's going to be bound by the decision, in which case the procedure transforms itself into arbitration, or if he's not. The merit of such modality of an arbitration is that it does not result in being exclusion of traditional courts on the part of the consumer. Uh, there's something wrong with the slides. I don't know why. Oh, I'm very sorry. Something happened to the slides and I have more of them, but this only goes up to the fourth. Well, well, let's talk about a little bit about the economic incentives behind the choice of online arbitration. Well, in some online arbitration is meant to satisfy the needs for dispute resolution of the parties and to a contract with a lesser degree of formality, less cost, and in a short amount of time. The fact that it stems from an agreement to arbitrate is meant to ensure that the parties themselves opt, I mean, go for this possibility, but also that they do so by choosing the rules that are to be applied, which in many cases are common sense rules of equity or general principles of law. The fact that the parties themselves can choose the arbitrator impresses upon the procedure this entrepreneurial element, which results in incentives to, put to the potential arbitrators to be the fairer, the most impartial, the most special in, in certain types of disputes, and the most efficient they can be. That they possess more special, specialized knowledge re regarding these types of disputes at hand and not necessarily on legal matters in turn potentially reduces the dispute resolution costs of the parties, since communicating with the arbitrator becomes easier and the need to hire a certified lawyer actually disappears. Well, costs in terms of, of time can also go down of the parties taking into account the value of the dispute, um, which is tends to be low, integrate the elements of due process of their own choice, 
privacy being one of the usual features of it. And finally, on an arbitration being, being simply arbitration that has integrated IC tools based on the internet in, in its functioning, it's meant to substitute national courts but by satisfying the need for dispute adjudication by means of its final product, a binding decision, a decision that is binding like a judgment is. Well, let me just, uh, I'm seeing here that, that we have some problems with the slides and they are rather important for this presentation. I'm going to up upload them again, just in a minute. Let's see if that works. Nope, same problem. I only can, I can only see a, I can only see until the fourth slide, which is problematic because I have more slides. Well, actually, we don't have enough time to go through the legal analysis explaining whether online arbitration is legally practic practicable or is allowed in both countries like Colombia and Germany. The short answer is that, well, it does. I mean, both both uh, legal systems are rather welcoming to the practice of online arbitration. But this is not the question that we should take order of all, all, all of our attention, but rather whether the applicable legal provisions to online arbitration in contexts such as, such as e-commerce consumer disputes allow it to achieve this very goal, upon which online arbitration in particular and arbitration in general was originally conceived. I mean, in, the, in that this will be the effective substitution of national courts. But let us just ask ourselves, what does online arbitration actually attempt to substitute and does it achieve it? Does it does it achieve success in this regard? Well, online arbitration is supposed to be a cheaper alternative to national courts for e-commerce disputes, e-commerce consumer disputes. That is, it should substitute national courts. It should be able to help the parties to the dispute to achieve resolution, but bearing lower costs, especially in countries with rather sluggish and, and very slow judicial systems, such as mine, such as Colombia. But what is, what is that thing that online arbitration wishes to substitute in countries like uh, Germany and Colombia? Given the, given the online arbitration is presented as an alternative mechanism of dispute resolution, we should give some thought to the word alternative. What does that mean? In short, from an economic standpoint, if a means is an alternative to other means, it is ultimately a substitute which in turn means that its demand expands when and if the demand for other substitutes contracts. In other words, when a good or a service becomes less interesting for market agents, prices paid for it normally decrease. And the prices paid for its substitute normally go up as their demand expands. Simple, it's just simple supply and demand uh, what we're talking about here. Following this train of thought, if online arbitration is to be considered an actual substitute for national courts, when it comes to the resolution of e-commerce disputes, of course, its demand should expand and the prices paid for it should go up as national courts become less and less attractive for consumers of e-commerce dispute resolution. The reason behind this is fairly simple, actually. Sellers and buyers have some costs or save some costs by, by exchanging through the Internet as they do not have to bear the cost of transportation to meet each other and even don't have to speak the same language in order to do so. These savings are important. These savings are usually passed on to the buyers in terms of lower retail prices. And if and, if, and when something goes awry with the contract in the event that the seller does not deliver, for example, or the buyer does not pay, going to national courts to litigate the dispute will imply bearing costs that were initially avoided, such as transportation to the to the court and the cost of managing the, ju the judicial system, which does, does not often come cheap. So in order to salvage some of the mutual gains of the original contract facing a low value dispute, it will be more efficient for the parties to resolve their dispute through means that integrate, integrate sorry, the very element that allow them to save those costs, those costs in the first place, like the internet itself. So through online arbitration in principle and taking into consideration the original objective of its design, the parties will give resolution to their low value disputes in less time through less monetary costs as they would not have to do it through lawyers than through litigation as in, at national courts. Online arbitration, sorry, may I ask 
can we solve the problem with the slides? Because I have a very interesting set of data here that I want that I would I would want to show them. Let me just try that again. I will. I will try to upload them again. Here we go. Uploading them. And I think we're good. No, same problem. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You just have to rely on what I say. But let's just, let's continue. Uh, where were where were I? Where was I? Um, Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, okay. So online arbitration would substitute for what is usually known as small claim procedures or SCPs. In Germany, with special attention to the e-commerce dispute, we should argue that what online arbitration would attempt to substitute is the German SCP, SCP, which is mentioned in paragraph uh, 495A of the TPO, and it's normally called Verfahren nach billigem Ermessen, or which would roughly translate as proceedings performed at the court's discretion or something like that. Uh, I hope my German is not that rusty. So according to the legal provision, to that legal provision, to that CPO of German law, the local court, that would be the Amtsgericht, can decide at its discretion on how to implement these proceedings when the value of the claim does not exceed the amount of 600 euros, I think. In the case of Colombia, the SCP is what is called the oral summary process or process of verbal sumario, which is which is an additional procedure for roughly disputes under 7,500 euros of value. The Colombian judge, regretfully, does not enjoy the flexibility enjoy enjoyed by the German judge deciding the necessary steps of the procedure. In addition to this, the cost of the procedure must always be paid by the unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessful party, which with no discretion of the judge as to decide otherwise, which does not happen in Germany. The Colombian SCP tends to be rather inflexible, demands more days of the year than its German counterpart, and it, is, it usually demands to hire legal representation. I mean, you have to lawyer up to go through the procedure. The German SCP does provide for the judge to create a sort of ad hoc SCP when the claim is of a low value. So essentially, the SCPs represent a lower degree of formality and simplicity, which we can be determined by the judge. In Germany, they are in paragraph uh, 78 of the TPO, excludes uh, of the mandate to be represented by a lawyer to those parties in cases that must be known by the local courts, the Amtsgericht. Not being the use of legal representation uh, by lawyers as a necessary condition, it could be argued that the language language of that litigants would have to use would not be of a, of a legal nature. In addition, in addition to this, judges take more uh, more of an interventionist role at oral hearings, which a judge must conduct in one of the if one of the parties are requested. Uh, Regret. Let me just know. Let me let me know if you can see the the table that I'm showing the slides because I cannot. It's a table that in which I chose through which I show I, I show the the different costs of using the legal systems both in Germany and, and and Colombia. But if not, let me just explain it. Uh, in this in this table that regretfully you cannot see, and uh, we can see that there is some value proposing online arbitration for most of e-commerce disputes. Both the Colombian and the German SCP significantly diminish the mutual gain contracts of the parties, while the German SCP does it to a lesser extent than the Colombian one. For example, in the case of the Colombian SCP, the costs of the procedure represent roughly 46% of the value of the claim, which is equal to the value of the contract in 3,5 years. You have to go to 3,5 years to be and done with it with the procedure well in germany a small claim is usually adjudic adjudicated at a cost that represents roughly the 14 or 15 percent of the value of the contract in 1,3 years in a more short uh, amount of time so in principle it could be argued that online arbitration applied to these disputes is sufficiently enhancing for market agents and as such 
that it should be considered as a valuable institution of public policy, especially for these kinds of disputes. However, and this is sad, such would be the case only if online arbitration is not made effective by means of these national courts, by means but uh, uh, of what we call legal sanctions. Okay. I mean, and in, in, in by this, I mean by the enforcement of these state courts. We should remember what we have said earlier, and that is that one of the fun most, the fundamental, if not the most fundamental of the elements of any kind of arbitration, including of, of online arbitration, is that it produces a binding decision one that is binding as a judicial decision is binding. This implies, in principle, that the means by which compliance is achieved is force, is actual force, which in turn is, 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 a, is, a, is the object of a monopoly of the state, and which in this case is administered directly by state judges. So that the final result of online arbitration is binding ultimately implies that it must participate to some degree of that monopoly. In this sense, whenever the online arbitration creditor faces what is usually known as a recalcitrant arbitration award debtor, the means by which this one induces that one to comply is that very thing that was initially excluded. You have to go back to national courts. This has important implications on the functioning of online arbitration. In the case of consumer disputes, the judge granting leave of enforcement to the arbitration decision must be sure enough that the dispute has been adjudicated in the terms of that public uh, applicable order will ma will mandate. The point here is finally that, regretfully, on an arbitration for these kinds of disputes, on account of the heavy involvement of the state through public policy regulations, regretfully does not end up substituting national courts. It is no longer an alternative to national courts because on an arbitration in this regard will be only as effective as national courts will be effective. So they complement rather than substitute national courts, which is, of course, sad. Uh, well, that would be my main presentation. Let me just go through some concluding remarks. First, on an arbitration is, simply put, arbitration with, uh, I mean, rather in, with a deep integration of ICT tools based on the internet to such a degree that, it all, that all due process elements that are observable in it are practiced through, through these tools, through the internet. Two, it is especially useful when applied to e-commerce disputes since it helps the parties salvage the initial mutual gains, gains of the contract since, since it integrates the very means which, uh, which made possible the, the initial exchange. And by this, we mean the internet. It is essentially three, it is essentially relevant in countries with rather sluggish and slow judicial systems, such as Colombia, since, since it in principle satisfies the demand for cheap dispute resolution for low value, high, low value, high volume transactions. And finally, while very useful for e-commerce dis consumer disputes, those low, low value, high volume sales, that it depends on national courts strips it of its alternative nature being only as effective as national courts are effective in the event that those courts are both able and, of course, willing to make it effective. And being so, finally, with the introduction of the introduction of those legal sanctions, many of those features that make it, that make in the first place in the first place online arbitration attractive are not observable of any, observable of any, uh, observable anymore. For example as decisions have to be made according to what judges expect, for, expect from them, the demand for certified lawyers expands, and the number of elements of due process in the procedure increases, resulting in higher costs in terms of, of both money and time, which were initially wanted to be avoided by the very the first use of, an, of, of, of online arbitration. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I'm, I'm sorry the slides didn't work because I had this very, I don't know, cool phrase at the end of, of, uh, of the presentation, which ich bedanke mich für die Aufmerksamkeit. It's a very long time in which I do not speak German anymore and I miss it. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, uh, I'm very eager to hear from hear your, your questions. Okay, 
Uh, Dr. Dusan, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, now we will move to the question and answer session. So all the people who are following the lecture, please, you can type your questions here in the chat. And uh, there are some greetings for you, Dr. Dusan, uh, not only from Colombia, but also from Berlin and from the Potsdam uh, University. Um, the first question that we can see here in the chat is, are there some private institutions in Colombia with approvals to do international arbitration? Yes, of course we have. I mean, when it comes to traditional physical arbitration, we have what we call here in Colombia uh, arbitration centers, which many of them are, are authorized by the state because the state has a very, I mean, clear control over them to do, to adjudicate international disputes. The problem is cost, because, for example, imagine that you have, uh, I mean, you, you just enter into a, an exchange with a seller in Germany, being a Colombian consumer. And, well, you're happy with the product. I mean, you're not happy then yet, but you pay the price and you're expecting that the product comes to your door through eBay or Amazon or whatnot. And something goes wrong and it results that this German seller is not that kind. And he just, instead of sending a, 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 a phone, a, a cell phone, he sent a, a bar of soap and you're very angry. What do you do? Well, there are normally international arbitration clauses in these platforms, but what do you know? I mean, you have to go to Germany in order to, I mean, as a consumer, sorry, you have to, you have the right to sue to present an arbitration claim in Colombia in front of that German seller. But the German seller has no incentives to come to Colombia to be a part of the dispute because of cost. He just sold a 1,000 euro cell phone and the disputes to resolve the, the dispute will cost him you know, twice as that. So here's when, when international online arbitration becomes in principle attractive because the parties do not have to move themselves from their locations in order to participate of the process. And so in short, even though we have those uh, international arbitration centers here in Colombia, uh, the problem is that they are not that efficient for low, low value, high volume disputes, especially with other contract, contract, contract parties coming from other parts of the world, such as Germany or China. Okay, um, that somehow answers the next question. Uh, there is somebody who is asking, in your opinion, has Colombia a good framework in terms of online arbitration in e-commerce? Well, that depends. Define good, good frame, good uh, legal frame. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it represents a rather welcoming environment to the practice of online arbitration. It allows for its signatures, its documents, but the thing is that as courts has such a heavy control on the over the final decision and there are very clear legal mandates within Colombian legislation that do not allow that consumer disputes are resolved on the basis of on the basis of on, of other uh, rules than Colombian consumer law uh, the initial spirit of online arbitration becomes null and void because the spirit is to adjudicate disputes in a in the most simple and swifter way possible of course respecting the the the, the, the fundamental rights of the parties but arbitrators in colombia even though it is a welcoming environment for the practice of online arbitration arbitrators in colombia are actually they all behave exactly like judges they take the same time as, ju as judges they do not know they know they don't they do not tend to know other sets of legal rules other than the colombian uh, code of procedure or colombian consumer uh, regulation and even if they if they dare to use another sets of of rules like general rules of of common sense uh, of, of of the rules of the contract if and when a judge finds out that the dispute was adjudicated on the basis on the basis of other law other than these consumer regulations the dispute the, the final decision will would not be enforceable so even though it is a welcome environment most likely if uh, the owner arbitrator behaves like it is initially intended to behave 
uh, it is most likely the scenario that uh, on arbitration would not be as effective as it should be. Okay. As you were saying at, uh, at the end of your presentation, I mean, there were some um, features or some characteristics of the, of the courts uh, that were supposed to be overcome by using this e-commerce online arbitration, but in, in, in real life, it hasn't happened. And there is another question here that seems very interesting within the framework of COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, the question is, was the COVID-19 pandemic a challenge for online arbitration, having in mind the superlative uh, growth of e-commerce? Because since we were uh, lack in lockdown, um, we didn't have the chance to get products uh, by going to the stores, or it was not a safe thing to do. So e-commerce increased. And of course, many of the products that we like to get are from oil companies in some other countries. So what was um, the situation here? Was it um, a challenge? And how? what has happened so far? Because we are still uh, during the pandemics. Well, of course, it represented a challenge for all of us, especially for those involved in online arbitration. But I am of the opinion that, and regretfully so, that it was a challenge that was not met with the high standards as expected. I mean, it was a challenge, but it was not resolved successfully. Why? Because online arbitration, as it is nowadays normally practiced, is the object of very heavy regulation. In this regulation raises costs, dispute resolution costs of using the, the, the dispute resolution mechanism that is online arbitration. So uh, I'm not I'm actually not aware of any evidence pointing to, to the to the fact that it was used more than before. And uh, what, what what happened is that judges face judges national judges facing the the, the requirements of attending the, the adjudication of disputes um, began to integrate those these ICT tools into the process into into the procedures. But in order to be able to innovate, as entrepreneurs do, and online arbitrators are in principle entrepreneurs they must be rather free to compete with each other, to find uh, innovative ways to meet the, the, the to, to, to satisfy the, the needs for, uh, of the consumer, uh, consumer resolution consumer, dispute resolution consumer, sorry. And they simply cannot do, do that. For example, in order to be an arbitrator in Colombia, you have to be a lawyer. You have to go through, through law school. And, even if in principle you can go to arbitration without a lawyer, being the language of the of the of the whole process of a legal nature, you are you you experience high incentives to hire a lawyer to lawyer up in order to go to arbitration. So you necessarily must face and bear the same costs that you usually bear when facing a when facing when when involved in in litigation. So those costs do not allow investments in. The arbitra in online arbitration procedures and do not allow competition between online arbitration uh, providers. So, no, I, I'm not aware of any evidence to, in that direction that, that, that the challenges obviously, obviously presented to online arbitration providers were successfully met. Okay. Um, when you were making the presentation, you presented us with a challenge, and the challenge was Google it. I mean, go to Google and find out about online arbitration in Colombia. And I was so interested in the topic that I did it, and I found out that there were 3,260,000 uh, results on this search that I did on online arbitration in Colombia. And uh, while I was looking at the information, I found out that there is information um, dating back from 2013, and the most updated information is from 2021, last year. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this, in this uh, sense, uh, there are some people here in the chat who would like to know, will you see online courts in the future in Colombia? Online because course. there is some kind of history, yes. Uh, we're seeing it. We're seeing them, actually. I mean, I don't, I don't know what an online court is, other than national judges using Skype or Zoom. Uh, but uh, 
if this is this situation is going to continue, and by this situation I mean that there is heavy regulation to be an arbitrator. That is, there is heavy re regulation to 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 the possibility apply to the possibility of adjudicating or resolving disputes of consumers in e-commerce. And there is actually no room for improvement. So even though you just search online arbitration in Colombia and many responses came up. I dare you furthermore to see which one of them are operative right, right now. Mm -hmm. It's very attractive at first to, to, to come with the idea, oh, I will, you know, go with some friends and found a, 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 a firm and, and the firm will uh, resolve disputes online. Many of them start that way. But sooner, sooner, more, sooner than later, they realize that it's just not worth it because of the cost of doing so. Mm -hmm. I was very when I when I came back to to Colombia well, that was six years ago seven years ago so I, was, and I was studying arbitration in Germany and, and arbitration international arbitration in general I was I was I was negatively impacted with the fact that arbitration in Colombia is just as inflexible and heavy regulated as national courts are so no I don't see I mean if, if that if that conditions hold. If those, if those conditions hold, I don't see any promising future for the practice of online arbitration in, in Colombia. Yeah, and if we if we were paying attention to your to your um, presentation, uh, you were trying to make a comparison between the the features of the German law system and the Colombian law system, and you were talking about this inflexibility and this um, much time that it takes in, in the in the national courts uh, to work on the process and and. and give an answer or come up with an answer to the consumer who is who is complaining and um the the high cost of the of the hiding of legal representation and and this is presented as an alternative uh to find a solution in this in this situation so the future doesn't look good that's it no regretfully no <laughs> i'm sorry for but, but no i mean being realistic no let's just to go over those those comparative costs again. I mean, in Germany, given a, a, a claim of a value of $5,000, let's put it in dollars, mm -hmm. the cost of the procedure go up almost to 15% of, of that cost, of that, of that value. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be roughly $200. Okay. The usual attorney fee will be 10% of that value. So the average procedure costs, including those lawyer fee, will be seven hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and this dispute will be resolved within one and a half year, something, almost five hundred days. In Colombia, given the same value of the original disputes, the cost of the procedures go up to forty-six percent of that of that of that value. That would be eight hundred dollars. And the usual attorney fee will be 30%. So in sum, the, I mean, that would be roughly $1,500 or euros if you want. And the average cost of the procedure, including those attorney fees, will be $2,300. And the, the dispute will be resolved within 1,288 days. That is a mm -hmm. lot of time. That will be more than three years. Yeah, for a low value than dispute. Than Comparing that to what normally happens in arbitration, given the same value of the dispute, the five thousand dollars, the average cost of the process will be six percent, not forty, not fourteen, not forty-six, six percent. That would be roughly three hundred dollars. There's no need for a lawyer, so those attorney fees will be none, will be zero percent. Mm -hmm. And the average cost of a procedure will be $300 in 60 days. So, of course, it is a very attractive alternative facing a sluggish judicial system such as we have in Colombia. We have a very, very slow and decrepit and inefficient judicial system in Colombia. In Germany, not so much. In Germany, we ha you have this Verfahren nach billigem Ermessen, this procedure that can be uh, modified at the judge's discretion in order to attend the, the needs for a low value dispute. But we don't have that in Colombia. 
And so, what about what about training of these these people for these online disputes? Um, are universities in Colombia, are colleges in university, or is there a special foundation or organism in Colombia in charge of preparing people for these arbitration processes? To I mean, to the best of my recollection, there are arbitration schools, you can say that, and mm -hmm. there are um, arbitration courses that are very actually very good. But the knowledge to be a good arbitrator does not come from the classroom. It comes from competition. I mean, as, as arbitrators compete to each other, with each other, they compete to be the most knowledgeable, the most, mm -hmm. the, the most specialized arbitrator. The best the prepared. Most, the best prepared. Mm -hmm. And that, that knowledge comes from the feedback of consumers mm -hmm. choosing or not choosing arbitrators. As from the knowledge good practices, being, uh, I guess, from good yeah. practices and experience. Yes, of course. Just mm -hmm. in the same manner as entrepreneurs know that they are successful, know that they are successful or a complete failure. Well, but my main point would be that even though online arbitration represents many promises, especially for judicial systems such as Colombia, and to so, and to some extent for judicial systems so, so, such as the German one, this would be only the case if force is not the main means by which compliance is induced by this i mean if you go to arbitrage to our online arbitration and you face uh the losing party is not willing to comply with the, the content of the decision well you have to go to the very thing you wanted to avoid in the first place that would be national courts i mean you start with arbitration initially avoided the use of national courts and then if you have if you face this even when you face this problem you need to go back to the very thing, the very slow, congested, inefficient thing that you wanted to avoid in the first place. That's so it. It's not an alternative. I, I, I'm struck with surprise mm -hmm. when my students say, say to me, well, arbitration is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. How alternative can it be if it, if its effectiveness depends on the very thing it wants to avoid? It's as okay. effective as courts are effective. And it's as, as effective as courts are willing to make it effective. So no, regretfully, this, there, I mean, in, within this scenario, in as long as it holds, there's not many promises behind on an arbitration. Regretfully, I'm sorry to hear that, Doctor Dusan. Thank you very much again for uh, your time and for being part of the Hepcopa lecture series. Um, if I am absolutely sure uh, shed some light on this issue in Colombia and in comparison to Germany. So thank you very much as well for all the people who were uh, connected on our YouTube channel. And we invite you next Wednesday, February 23rd, to the lecture Waste Management, Waste Reduction, and Circular Economy uh, by Dr. Angelica Muscus. You are cordially invited to Dr. Dusan as well. So thank, thank you very much, everybody. And See you soon. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.